So we are back. <coughs> and Peter, did you want to talk to us about seven? That was, isn't that the linkage flag, or do you want to just let that ride for a while? Um, so Peter Griffin, Office of Legislative Council. The Section 7 in the underlying language of 9-11 is the annual link-up section um, that gets passed every year. Our state statutes point to certain federal definitions, and uh, the way we're linked up to them is at a fixed point in time, and each year it needs to get moved ahead in one year. Um, I mentioned to Senator Cummings this morning that um, that section of 9-11, at least uh, as I understand the committee's discussion so far, has been pretty non-controversial. I mentioned her this morning, there might need to be a small change in there in light of some of the uh, recent federal changes. But um, uh, next time I present a draft to you, I'd be happy to, to yeah. do that. We're modern. This usually goes in the miscellaneous tax bill. Mm -hmm. But it got put in here. So we'll put it in there too since we're not sure what's going to make it through. Okay. Now, our, today, shortly, Right, we are going to hear some, let me find, all right, it's gone. Cheryl, can you find me a new agenda? Since I have lost my, <coughs> I've got yours, thank you. Um, well, maybe, what time is Christine, we told Christine three? Okay. Yes, and Jake was And Jake is here. We put Jake off so many times. I, Jake, I wanted to have you and Christine in because you're both going to be talking about the uh, charitable deduction, which is the one thing we haven't agreed on. I won't say we completely agreed on everything else, but um, you were going to do some runs for us, impacts on different income levels, is that? Um, yeah, there's some okay. stats and some examples. Okay, that's what we were looking for. Okay. All right, so I'm not, excuse those of us that are finishing our lunch. We've been off the floor half hour ago. Okay. Uh, Jake Feldman, Tax Department. Thank you for having us back. So, um, so I want to thank you. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I wanted to point out um, that something really wonderful has happened. Um, uh -oh. you know, oh, great. <laughs> we we were faced with um, the Tax Custom Job Act. The administration put forward a reform proposal to try to keep Vermonters' liabilities about the same and, and ways and means basically like that. And except for a few minor things, um, it's nearly identical. So that's that's kind of great. Nearly identical to the governor's, the governor's, to the governor's proposal. proposal. Yeah. Okay. yeah. And then there is us. Right. Right. So there are really just, as you know, a few a few details still left to be decided, but um, it's really encouraging that there's so much consensus. And I also wanted to point out that, that either the Ways and Means Plan or the Administration's Plan would be relatively easy to implement. It's going to take us a little bit of time to you know um, do the changes to the forms and the instructions. But our IT vendor has said that it's within the, their annual cost for upgrades, so it's not a new cost for them. And Mr. Feldman, I'm sorry to interrupt, but you, uh, your title again and where do you fall in all of this? Are you a member of JFO? I just don't recall. No, no. He's you're, the tax tax you're the administration. Yeah. Okay. 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 That's why it's wonderful. That's why it's wonderful. <laughs> yeah. my, my title is tax research statistician. Right. I work um, on income taxes and education sure. taxes. Thank you. He was here. Yeah, I just didn't recall. a rare Yes, I have it oh, right. pulled up on next to my desk. <laughs> okay. So um, there's a huge amount of overlap um, between what we initially presented in H911. We're starting with AGI, which is already current law. It was passed last year, and so it's already on the books. 
Um, of the states that have an income tax, it's something like 32 or 33 start with AGI, so it's very common. Um, the standard deduction is the same between the plan we initially presented and H-911. The personal exemptions, um, we, we settled on amount of $4,000 for each person in your family. Um, the reason we chose that amount is because um, the way we were structuring our plan, we were trying to get people's liabilities to be as close as possible, and that value, you know, really mm -hmm. sort of went right down the middle. Um, I also looked at other states that define their own personal exemptions, and um, they're often they're not as generous um, as Vermont's. So, um, four thousand dollars seemed like a reasonable number, and it's also a nice round number um, since we're sort of starting fresh. H 911 went um, with 4150 which is just slightly more generous for people, you know, larger families, more people in your family. Um, earned income tax credit, both plans would increase it from 32 to 35 percent. Um, so Social Security, we were planning um, to do um, a third of it this year, and I believe that it was being paid for in another part of the budget. Right. My understanding is that um, Ways and Means and H911 um, wanted to do all of it this year, and they're paying for it within the income tax reform. Right. And there's a small cost there that, that Graham knows. I believe it's two to four million dollars or something like that. When you say pay for it within income tax reform, what do you mean? Which income tax reform? So both plans. This yeah. Or something else. Um, this. This only. Yep. yep. And the budget that came out this morning uh, does not have funding for this. Oh, okay, good to know. Both plans would have lowered the all marginal rates by 0.2%. Um, H911 would have, there are five brackets and five <laughs> marginal rates. H911 would have taken the top two and collapsed them into a single bracket. Um, and they were basically setting the stage for their income tax surcharge. So they would have brought the top marginal rate to 8.6%, and then they would have added 1% on top of that, which would have brought, come up to 9.6%, um, which is a, a, a point that they felt was, was reasonable. I asked why that they wanted to keep everyone under 10%. Under 10, okay. Um, and I'd like to point out something. Um, slightly unusual, but um, in the testimony that I offer today, um, we are actually, the administration is actually advocating for a slightly higher top marginal rate. So H911 would have been a top marginal rate of 8.6. We're advocating for 8.75, which would still drop us below New York. But the reason is that we would like charitable contributions to to be entirely eligible for the credit, so no cap on charitable contributions. And um, we discussed that internally, um, and we felt it was appropriate, and it also helps sort of correct at the top to keep people's liabilities closer. So you don't want to collapse the top, or you want to collapse them and raise the rate to 8.75? No collapse. No collapse. Correct okay. as they are in the law, but each one would be reduced by 0.2%. So instead of a top marginal rate of 8.95 for Vermont, we would be 8.75, which would put us below New York. Okay. And you're starting the, okay, yeah. Yeah, okay. and it, it would start um, up where it does now, 424, 950. And then, so the main um, thrust of my testimony today is that the charitable contributions, <clears throat> um, H911 capped it at $10,000 eligible for the credit, and the administration would like all charitable contributions to be eligible for the credit. It's a 5% credit. So um, to, to just sort of set the stage, in 2017, which is the taxes that we all just filed, um, if you itemize your deductions at the federal level, you fill out the Schedule A and there's a line for charitable contributions on there and that's where you would record it. Um, in Vermont, if you itemize at the federal level, you do something called the IN-155 and that's where it kind of sorts out which deductions are going to be allowed to pass through to Vermont. Charitable contributions is one of the ones that it fully does pass through. 
Um, so whatever you claimed at the federal level, you can claim the same amount um, in Vermont, and it and it subtracts from your taxable it income. It passes through as part of your taxable income. Yep. It reduces your taxable income. It reduces yep. your taxable income. That's now. That's current. Yep. So um, that's important because that's conceptually, you know, part of the reason why we're turning charitable contributions into a credit because. And, and we want all of it to be allowed towards the credit because right now all of it is considered um, when you when you compute your Vermont taxable income. So in 2018, a few things changed at the federal level. Um, the standard deduction went up so much that the percentage of filers who are going to itemize is going to go down a lot, from about 30 percent of all filers to only about 10 percent. So that means that a lot of middle income people who used to keep track of their charitable contributions and their mortgage interests and their state and local income taxes, they, they may have no reason to keep track of them anymore because the standard deduction is so big that they're not even going to be itemizing. And what that um, further means is that if you used to really keep track of your charitable contribution receipts, at some point your tax preparer might say, hey, don't worry about that, we're taking a standard deduction, and then you might say to yourself, well, why am I even giving to charity? Some people might say. And so part of the reason for the Vermont credit is that we are reintroducing the incentive, but it's not going to be just for itemizers, it would be for everyone who makes charitable contributions. And ways and means like that idea, and so that's, that's part of H911. A 5% credit for all your charitable contributions. Whether you itemize or not. Whether you itemize or not. So. Um, we can't often itemize the Vermont level, right? We're no. just, right now, we're just doing standard deduction in Vermont. Currently? Oh, in 18, next year. Am I going to be able to itemize in Vermont next year for my Vermont taxes? For, for 2018, if, if this committee or if no change were <laughs> made, then if you itemize at the federal level, then in Vermont you would get some of those same right. itemized deductions. Well, yeah. But when it comes to Vermont taxes next year, no matter what I did, at the, you know, something would flow through. <coughs> I'm not going to itemize on my Vermont taxes anymore. Right. Under, getting a standard deduction. Exactly. Under both of these reform plans, everyone would get this standard deduction. So um, conceptually, if, you, if the charitable contribution still exists as a deduction, then it's a little bit funny to have a charitable contributions deduction and a standard deduction. That's not the way it usually works. So that's another reason that the charitable contributions are being turned into a credit. I, I don't accept that. We do, we do many things on the tax form that are not consistent. If we wanted to have a charitable deduction flow through, there's no reason why we couldn't do it with the standard deduction. You could, but if you made it a charitable we're, You're the one who's suggesting a standard deduction. The federal government has standard deduction and they let the charitable thing go through. But if, you're, if your itemized deductions are less than the standard deduction... You don't you take the standard to, deduction. Right. 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 So but we, we could, there's no reason we couldn't deal with the charitable deduction as a deduction as well as have a Vermont specific standard deduction. We'd just be writing the tax form that way, right? Um, it, I think it would be unprecedented um, among states. Um, so if you, if you made charitable contributions that were less than the standard deduction for Vermont, um, would you would you report your charitable contributions, or would you take the Vermont standard deduction? So there again. He's saying you could do both. Uh, let's you let's do just, both. just let's isolate the charitable issue. If you did everything you suggested, and you decided to do the charity thing as a deduction rather than a credit, what would stop us from doing that? You you could. Um, the question is, how do you, if you, is it only available to people who itemize at the federal level? Well, you could either say that, or you could say, you could also say it's available to everybody. 
it's an add, add it on to your, your standard deduction. So the, everyone would get the standard deduction? You could, whatever way we decide it, it's doable, is all I'm saying. I suppose so. So it sounds like there's a lot of overlap. Um, what this, these plans both say is that all people get the standard deduction, and then charitable contributions are a sort of a separate world. Right. Um, you're saying <coughs> treat them as a subtraction for everybody, which is doable. We're saying turn them into a 5% credit. And what the effect of the 5% credit is, is the benefit of charitable giving is the same to all filers under that scenario. <coughs> If it, if it's, I think one of the things, one of the things that I watch it. <laughs> one of the things that I would like to see is for the people who are trying to preserve the charitable deduction for the people who are now going to start taking the standard deduction where previously they itemized. Let's say somebody gave item gave ten thousand dollars. Maybe that's the wrong number. $10,000 in charity, and previously they had um, itemized. But now because of this shift, this is what's driving this conversation, I think, that 30% of people who used to itemize can go down to 10%, okay? So if we're gonna try and preserve the uh, tax deductibility of the charitable, or the tax savings from the charitable giving, what I'm trying to understand is if you look at somebody who's like in the, I don't know, pick a number, $60,000 income range, if they gave $10,000 and itemized, how much would they save on their Vermont taxes? Their effective tax rate is likely around 4%. Okay, perfect. So they're saving $400. Under this plan, they would save 5% of that $10,000, which would be $500. It's making the benefits of charitable giving available on the same basis to all filers, no matter income. Right. Or but, the, but the person higher income. the higher income person yeah. who's at 8.9%, you're reducing their deductibility down to 5%. The highest effective tax rate you really ever see in Vermont is around 6.7%. Okay. So, so <coughs> yes, there is a slightly reduced benefit. The marginal rate is 8 point. The highest marginal rate is 8.95%. There is a slightly reduced benefit. That's true. There are other things like lowering all the marginal rates for <coughs> those filers somewhat. I'm not saying that everyone's liability is going to be exactly the same. With regards to the charitable contribution, what we're doing is what a lot of tax think tanks advise to do with itemized deductions, turn them into credits, because then they're available on the same basis to all filers. So the charitable contributions we're proposing as a 5% credit. You get a 5% credit no matter what your income level. So if you make if you're in the top bracket, you're still going to get the same amount for a $100 deduction as you are if you're in a lower income bracket. Right now it comes down from your taxable income. It can bring you into a lower tax bracket, which is sometimes a reason for giving if you're close. Uh, you do the figuring and figure out where you are. Present. Under, let's talk about presently because anyone who follows the laws, or, we're now operating under the new federal tax system. But it's jobs in JT, TER, whatever it is. So under, so I file my taxes next year. If I give a 10, $20,000 donation. It is probably worth my while, given that I'll have other deductions, to itemize. And that won't flow through to Vermont now. Is that correct? Your, your other itemized deductions will not flow through to Vermont. You, uh, but how about charitable deductions? Charitable will come through and will be converted to a credit. No, if we don't do anything. If you don't do anything. Right, if we don't do anything and I file my federal tax credits, I did, all right, 
I'm going to deduct. I'm going to get twenty million or twenty thousand deducted for my taxable income at the federal level. I'm remembering from yesterday, but that's below the AGI. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Social Security is above it. Right, it's below AGI. Okay, so where last year that twenty thousand flowed through to my reduce my taxable income in Vermont. This year, it doesn't reduce my taxable income in Vermont. It reduces it at the federal level. So if we want to duplicate the old system where it also reduced my tax, taxable income in Vermont, I think we've got two approaches. Senator Sorotkin saying we could just say, okay, you get the standard deduction, and if you give 20000 you get another deduction there, or you get a percentage. We could reduce your taxable income, or what everybody else but us so far has decided is it's probably, you could also say, okay, for your $20,000, you're going to get a, you know, a maximum of a $500 tax credit. So rather than reducing your taxable income, and then you go all the way in, you get your taxes, and you take 550 whatever that 5% is, off of your taxes. And that will impact, on the lower end, for some folks, it, they'll do better than they would if they reduce their tax. Of, uh, for some, right. but for some on the higher end, they will also do better because so, it depends on if it throws you into another tax bracket or. Right. So you can work it so it does. You can work it so it does. Right. That's why so we pay it out. Turning it, no, turning it into a 5% credit is a progressive element of this plan. It increases Vermont's progressivity. Right. If you left it as a deduction, it's more valuable to higher income taxpayers. <coughs> so this is a progressive element, and, and we think that it, it's a reasonable approach. Okay. Well, so, does that mean that this is less desirable for the large donor than the system that we have now? It could be slightly less desirable, but there are other things happening, such as lower marginal rates, um, that, may, that may make them you know, reasonable. By low, lower marginal rates, you mean at the federal level, not at the state I'm talking level. about Vermont. We, but the lower marginal rates are two tenths of one percent. Across all margins. Whenever you pay income taxes, your income yeah. travels through each yeah, bracket. But it's a, like two tenths of one percent in any in uh, given each bracket. bracket. Yeah. That's pretty marginal, I would think. So um, I, I would say I that if you're a high income. I mean, it's like, uh, yeah. not meaningful. Maybe we should see if someone could calculate that for us. <laughs> I do have some very simple examples. On okay, that. yeah, okay. And it might be good. And Graham, I don't know if you can do it, or Peter, maybe you. Um, it's been brought up that the 2% tax, uh, the reduction, in rates at all levels. So your marginal rate's only gone down 0.2, but it's gone down 0.2 at every level, because we were progressive on the way up. Pick a number uh, in, in that income category and see if you can figure out what that does reduce you know if you're making what is our top bar you yeah, know four categories we're making yeah if you're making five hundred thousand how much I don't know if you can do that unless we got a tax find a tax liability and just see if you can figure out what pretty straightforward to do yeah it's four I mean, yesterday examples he gave us a tax yeah. and see if we can figure out yeah, we've got, so, and Jake, you had some examples, yes, which I do. think might, that's what we were looking for, is okay. to so, how this hits small, medium, and my, I have I have two examples, they're extremely simple. Okay. Um, they're on the back of the handout that I just distributed. So, um, the, in H911, 
the top marginal rate is 8.6%, and there's a $10,000 cap on charitable contributions. Um, and what I'm offering is a top marginal rate of 8.75% and no cap on charitable contributions. Yeah. And the reason that we, um, that that, that those are, are favorable provisions is because it keeps liabilities closer to what they would be now. Um, under H-911, if you're a higher income person who does not make any charitable, that, that lower top marginal rate is very appealing. Mm -hmm. And your liability would be lower than under the administration's original plan. So I have an example here, $600,000 of income and they don't make charitable contributions. It's kind of an unusual example, but I, I want it to be simple. So for 2018, they would have owed 45,100 in Vermont. Under the administration's plan, they owe about 44,100. But under H911, um, it's lower than that, it's 43,800. Now, someone, um, a, a filer, who makes $600,000 in income but donates $50,000 to charity, um, they would actually owe uh, quite a bit more under H911 than they would have um, had, you know, before the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. And the administration's plan actually brings them back closer to what they would have owed. So if you can imagine a line up at the, the higher incomes for effective tax rate, um, both plans are close to the line on average, but there's a lot more variance in the H911 plan. And it's really decided by whether you make charitable contributions or not. So the administration's plan actually hews closer to what the way things are now. So we asked, uh, I think Graham, this question, maybe you have the same numbers. If we went with the, all things being equal, if we went with the administration's plan and lifted the cap on charitable contributions, how much more money would we have to find for the budget? Um, Graham has those numbers. I feel like he said it was $8 million, but I'm not. We'd have to find $8 million. We'd have to find $8 million. If we went with the governor's plan. If you, but, if you did everything in 9-11 yeah. and removed the cap on the charitable contributions, you'd have to find $8 million extra dollars. But the thing is that that's, I'm saying lift the cap, but bring the top marginal rate up to 8.75. So it's not 8 million, it's some much with a smaller number than that. So they, in H911, they collapsed the top two brackets to 8.6% and we're, we're saying 8.75. 3, 3 million? Yeah, if you, if you didn't collapse the top bracket, you'd gain an extra 3 million. So. I can't say how it all would interact, <laughs> yeah. but then we have to figure out what we're looking at. Do. You know what? Well, you reviewed that with us yesterday. It was mostly the high income folks that we got that three million from, correct? By definition, By because you yes. because right. you collapse under the top. Yes, yeah. right. Yeah. Okay. So you you have to extra, and what? <coughs> yeah. So we need. Do you, do you know what it would gain to raise that marginal rate up to the eight seven five? Well, if you didn't clap the top of the act, then you have the vaccine Oh, that's where the money would come from. Right. The, all right. The so we got three. All right. So we got to find at least $4 million more if we want to do that. At least that's it. If we want to do the no cap. All right. <laughs> no cap, but you also have to collapse the brackets. Right. Or not collapse. Not the collapse. Right. I'm saying if we want to do the full charitable deduction. On the Vermont Correct. side. On the Vermont side. Then it's an $8 million hole. All right. So. It's an $8 million hole at 8.6%, but if it's the top bracket's 8.75%, it's less than that. Right. We've got, we've got three, what, yeah, it's about $3 million. Right. So um, in each we're looking for $8 million or $5 million. Right, we're either looking for eight million or we're looking for five million. Right. <coughs> in each seven, we increase personal exemptions from four thousand to forty-one fifty. That that brings like families a little bit less than what they would have owed before the you know before the tax cuts and jobs act. So that if it was four thousand, that that group would be about the same 
and there would be a few million dollars there. Um, it's going to be a little harder to put through. I think they also use some of that savings to fund the Social Security. Yes. Yeah. It's been suggested here, and I know we're going to talk about in a few minutes, um, perhaps not going all the, as far up as the other two plans did, but mm -hmm. move it down. Graham's going to tell us if we're going to make any money that way. Yes. But that's another moving piece. So on this on the charitable deduction stuff, we we're focusing on the individual impact on the individual Vermonter. Is there any way when you say eight million dollars more to do the governor's plan, that means doing the house plan we're losing eight million dollars in revenue. Is there any way to use that number to figure out how much the charities are losing? We have to figure the, the federal side at the same time. Right. No, the charities could be losing nothing if people keep giving at the same rate, regardless so, of the tax impact. So that's a complicated issue. That's something like if the if the cost of charitable giving increases, how much does charitable giving change? That's elasticity, and there are there is research on that. Um, my colleague Andrew could could offer that. I have some very simple statistics here that might help illuminate some of that. So, um, Senator Sirach, in, in my next bullet, um, if, if charitable giving was capped at $10,000, then about $360 million out of a total of $500 million that's claimed by Vermont filers would be disincentivized. So that's about 70 or 72%. And I only include residents here because residents pay 93% of all Vermont taxes. And if you include non-residents, you get some pretty wild, big values that throw off everything. So I'm only looking at residents. They give about 500 million a year. And if you capped it at 10,000, then 360 million of that would be disincentivized at the Vermont level. The administration is, is hoping that the nonprofits can continue to receive the same funding with the same incentive because many reasons, but one reason is that it, it takes some pressure off the state. Uh, um, honestly. There's a like the DNA. Yes. 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 So so if you're, which is fine, but if you're trying to measure the effect on the, the receiving charity, you have to also account for what's going to be going on on the federal side. Right. So, so the federal benefit of charitable giving is about three times as much as Vermont benefit, and that's because federal tax rates are now about three times higher. They used to be about four times higher, but now they're about three times higher. So you're right, Senator McDonald, most of the benefit is at the federal level. And that brings me to my final point, and something that, that I heard this committee talking about. So as part of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, they increase the amount of AGI you can give from 50% to 60%. So I heard some members of this committee saying, well, aren't a lot of givers going to benefit from that? that only 38% of the group who's potentially going to be capped in Vermont give at that very high level. Mm -hmm. So most folks are giving less than half of their AGI. They're more normal amounts. <laughs> and so they're not going to see, receive any benefit. So there are some who may go up to 60%, <laughs> but most will not. Most will just continue. So this number here says, 38% of all Vermonters presently are at the maximum amount of giving? No, of the ones who were over 10,000. So the ones who were, could potentially be capped by H911, mm -hmm. only 38% are at the federal maximum amount. So, you're, so an argument saying, well, it doesn't matter if Vermont caps them because they're going to, at the federal level, they're going to get more benefit. 38%. But most are not up there. Well, correct. But those, the ones that are up there have more money than they had the previous year because of the federal tax cuts. Right. So that, that gets to my previous testimony. <coughs> the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act eliminated the state income tax deduction. Correct. But that's the state side. That's no, the federal that's side. No, that's the federal side. Gotcha. Okay. 
So they, right. Senator McDonald, you're right, some might have more, it kind of depends on their situation, but some are gonna actually find themselves in a worse position because they used to be able to deduct all their state income taxes and now they basically can't. Okay. And property taxes. Property, they up to 10,000 for the two of those combined. So that's a lot to your tax. Someone has an opinion on whether those folks, the third on the federal side, can continue to enjoy it. Level of deduction. Are they going to be giving more or less of the same amount of money? Yeah. We don't know what the is. I'm not exactly sure. Um, I'm, I think some might go up to 60%. Some, uh, it's hard to say. It's all an individual. And we've got a next witness, Phil slightly ahead, helps people plan the fill in the land for me. Um, but the one thing she pointed out to me is that when you're planning, if you're doing 60% of your income, it may well be your last years when you are disposing of your income or your assets. And the federal government has also doubled the exemption for the inheritance tax. So now that you can pass twice as much on without being taxed at the inheritance tax, there's, you know, if you have heirs, there's more of an incentive, you know, there's an incentive to pass more on rather than to give it away. You did. Okay. This is above my, you know, my, my. Or you can give more and your heirs yes. can get more and than they used to get. You get right. both. And every single taxpayer is going to be a, a, an individual circumstance and going to make an individual set of opinions. How much do I like my kids or not? And do I want to leave them? And how much did I like my dog and want to leave the Humane Society? Oh, I thought you were going to leave it to the dog. <laughs> <laughs> so they want the tar baby here. Get buried with the dog. But, Isn't that what Leona at home sleep in? Yes, Leona oh, yeah. got buried with the dog. Oh no, she left all her money to She left all her money to the that's dog. Right. That's right. Somebody else got buried straight. with the dog. So that's what we can't predict. And we can agonize over this. We can make some general inferences. The really big donors, which when you're talking 50, 60 percent of your income, are the exceptions. They endow buildings at universities. They build sports arenas, all right? The, the ones we should be worried about, and they, from anything I've seen, they are the bulk of the donors. They're not the people with multi-million dollar incomes. They're the people from, I think it's 100 to 500,000. Many of those, it's not, are not going to be itemizing now. Um, especially if they're older, you know, and don't have a lot of income. Those are the donors I think the charities are working but not the ten dollar, you know, fifty dollar variety, but the thousand, five thousand dollars variety. And that's that's where the change is. If I'm gonna endow a building at UVM, I'm probably going to endow a building at UVM. Tax code or no tax code, because there's something else, but if I'm going to do a thousand dollars to the Humane Society, I may think twice, especially if I. Can I ask a question? Yeah. So, how can we tell? Uh, do we know the percentage? The, who gives the most? So, if we were to look at a, a pie chart of the percentage of uh, the hundred to five hundred thousand give forty million. Yes. So they are, but of the two hundred ninety-six million, million given yes. by those over a million. Mm -hmm. So 
the, that percentage. Ernie Pomerlo's gone. Of the total, I know. Unfortunately. I'm sure uh, he's in these numbers. Yeah, so, I mean, is so it. These tables are just for the ones who are over 10,000 in giving? Right, and these are only for itemizers. <coughs> right. Okay, so. so it's, it's a limited data set, but I could yeah. try to find that for you. That would be um, interesting. We spent a lot of time researching how much the non-itemizers give to yeah. charity because we needed that for our model, yeah. and that mm -hmm. was kind of kind of interesting research. Um, and and we eventually settled on a number of about one percent of their income. So like fifty thousand dollars of income would be about five hundred dollars, and that's what's in our our model. That's shaping okay. these estimates. So um, there is research on that. And I'd be happy to come back and, and share with you. Okay, but unfortunately. Okay. This bill has got to come out. Oh. And I just think we can agonize over each individual case, but eventually we're going to have to fish or cut bait. We can do nothing and wait and see what happens next year. We can do something and adjust next year if what we think is going to happen doesn't. Um, and if we decide to do something, because there are a lot of people who itemized last year and took off charitable deductions. This year, they're not going to be they're not going to be itemizing because you know they're going to get the double standard deduction at the federal level, so they're not going to be itemizing. The question seems to be, will they still give a thousand dollars to the Humane Society, or will they say? Well, if I'm not going to get a tax credit, maybe I'll take a cruise. Uh, so which side do we err on, Madam Chair? The side of the... See, I, I guess I'm working in Vermonters who struggle with affordability or charities that worry about what's going to be coming well, in. Some of these charities I said, work with the folks that are struggling. No, no, I just said, who, on no, which no, side do we err on? In I our don't decision know. Oh, okay. well, then. Which side are you going to err on, Senator? The right side. Which and which one is that, Senator? <laughs> so, are we young, finished with a tar baby here for a while? Uh, yeah. Get on to other stuff? Okay. <laughs> All right. So, I know our next witness has come in. Have we got anything more for Jake? Or, Jake, do you have anything more for us? Or can you just not wait to get out of here? I it's going to be worse. No, I want to say off. thank you for this. This is really yeah, very helpful. helpful. Yeah. Really um, helpful. No, I, I thank you for letting me come in. Um, and I just want to reiterate that we hope that um, charitable contributions are fully incentivized and a top marginal rate of 8.75 is an improvement. Um, and it doesn't have to go as low as 8.6, it could be 8.75 and we'd be happy. Now, is it correct that this administration's position that if we move that rate to 8.75, that we eliminate the cap on uh, uh, charitable deductions? you will still have sufficient funds to do the social security change? No, oh. no the social, we initially had social security. Um, you were doing a third, a third, a third. Yeah. They probably get out of human services. Right. It was in the budget. It was in the budget, but now it, it's back in income tax. So I think you would find yourself a little bit short. So you'd you find wanted. yourself short by, in this case, to fully fund it, to be short about $4 million, as I recall. Something like that, yep. Yeah. Yep. And for the change in the marginal rate, is there any formula by which if you change the marginal rate by a certain percentage that you, the marginal, all of the marginal rate, if you change it by a certain percentage, it would raise a certain amount of money? It, it's, um, it's more of a guess and check process, <laughs> honestly. Um, so we have a, a micro simulation model and what we do is we you know we go in there and we we just try out different values to well i guess what i'm looking system. for is uh, if we do what you're suggesting we do in order to deal with the charitable issue if we wanted to deal with the social security issue at the same time and we dealt with it by dealing with the marginal rates how much would the marginal rates have to change in order to provide enough money to deal with social security could we take them down point 0.1 rather than point 0.2 Right. My guess is you would be over. You would generate some money that if you only went down by 0.1. But wow. that, how much? 0.15. Uh, 
I would love to go back to my office. Well, you want to go back and see okay, if you can run Could you tell us that? Because I think that's going to be important. To, and I'm assuming that a lot of us are, are concerned about being able to provide the Social Security relief that, that, that a lot of people are asking for. Uh -huh. But we have to know what the impact is, and we don't want to raise, quote, raise taxes in order to do it, though. The, the thing about it is that um, sort of everything is connected. Right. So if you start changing all the marginal rates, you're going to really throw things off yeah. in one way or the other. Yeah. So it's kind of a delicate recipe. Right. Well, yeah. basically, that would be one or the other uh, approach would be, can you come back to us by saying, if we wanted to fund the Social Security uh, change, what would be your recommended solution as a way to do it within the context of this bill with rates? Well, personal exemptions could be at four thousand dollars, and that would that would families would be set. You know, they would be made whole. Mm -hmm. So the, under H nine eleven, they actually got a little bit of a reduction. Mm -hmm. um, four thousand dollars, coupled with the lower rates, actually puts them back where they would have been. Mm -hmm. So I mean, and would that produce four million dollars? Or more like or less? Two or three? I, I don't remember. Were exactly. we yesterday talking well, about I wonder if you're able to, to give us this afternoon well, a, a proposal right. to how to do that within the context of this in terms of your best best approach that you would recommend to us. I will send something over. Okay, because okay. yeah, Graham's numbers said that if we didn't lower the rates or collapse the the top two, that 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 was thirty four million dollars, right? So if so if, if we only need four or six, it seems like we might be able to do 1.999 and get the but amount the other, that we the need. The other approach, though, of lower, lowering the exemption from 4150 to some number lower than that might it's do that as well. And that might be, in fact, a cleaner way to do it because that way you'd still preserve the rate reductions and, and, and the reductions in, in, in the marginal rates. That, gets that might just be a cleaner way of right. doing it. I mean, but if you could find out what that number would look like without mm -hmm. slaying all weekend, that would be great. Sure, I'd okay. like to try. Okay. okay. Thank you. All right. So, um, Christine is here. Christine, come on up. And Christine is one of my constituents, and she sent me an email. And we talked for a few minutes yesterday, and I thought it would help the whole committee to hear what she had to say. So why don't you just, we need you to just say your name for the t record because we tape everything and we just need the name to go with the voice. Great. So Christine Zaki. My business is for philanthropy. Okay. Um, great. So thank you so much for squeezing me in. I know that you've heard a lot of testimony on H911 already and specifically um, this issue around the charitable deduction versus a charitable tax credit um, and the cap on it. Um, I appreciate you taking the time to squeeze me in at the last minute as you're wrestling with all of this. Um, a little background on the perspective that I bring to this. Um, I am the principal of a philanthropic advising firm called Forward Philanthropy that's seven years old um, and prior to that worked with the Vermont Community Foundation in several different capacities um, uh, doing philanthropic advising. Um, so I bring about 15 years of experience in philanthropic advising to the table here. Um, full disclosure, I am not an accountant. I am not a wealth advisor. I am not an attorney. Um, but I'm a philanthropic advisor and I work with people who give. Um, my business is centered around working with funders, specifically families, family foundations, corporate foundations. Um, so my presentation that I wanted to share with you briefly is divided into two pieces. The first piece is quantitative, and that you hold that in your hands, and the second piece is qualitative. Um, so in regards to the quantitative piece, I want to emphasize a couple points, some of which I think you may have heard already. Um, one point in regards to H911 is that we know that taxpayers who don't receive an itemized deduction currently already give that already happens. It's not behavior that we necessarily need to incentivize because those taxpayers, myself included, already give generously. Um, the, coupled with that, we also know that when nonprofits fundraise, 
the most efficient way for a nonprofit to fundraise, the way that costs them the least amount of money and where they can raise the most amount of money as effectively as possible is through major donor giving. Um, and so I've included those numbers for you here. And so um, if you look in the middle of this page here, major donor giving costs a nonprofit about 15 cents to raise a dollar versus at the bottom of that list of bullets to acquire a new small donor by direct mail could cost a nonprofit a dollar to raise a dollar or even a dollar 25. They could lose money acquiring small donors. I think so politicians understand that. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, um, in regards to um, thinking about the most effective, efficient ways to drive revenues to nonprofits to support them in doing the important work that they're doing, major donor fundraising is the way for them to do that. Um, so, briefly. Um, so this is the status quo. When we look forward to what the projected impacts are, the Tax Cuts and Job Act, um, the, what we know right now is that the great minds who make these predictions <coughs> universally agree that there's four ways in which the Tax Cut and Jobs Act are predicted to reduce charitable giving. Um, one being lowering the individual income tax rates, capping those state and local tax deductions, increasing the standard deductions, and also, importantly, doubling the estate tax exemption, which significantly reduces the motive for charitable giving when there's a death of a loved one in a family. It's often a time for really significant gifts. So all told, what we know right now is that the TCGA will reduce the marginal tax benefit of charitable giving by 25%, um, which is projected to cost nonprofits between 12 and 20 billion dollars. Um, so one of the pieces I want to point out here, especially in terms of um, looking at the impact of the, what is already going to be unfolding with the Tax Cut and Jobs Act, and then any further implications that the state of Vermont might take with H911 is is how donors give. And so donors give through their checkbook, you know, on an annual basis, as so many of us do. And also, donors give at the events, at, at what we call taxable events in the industry. So that might be the death of a loved one when an inheritance is coming your way, or often it's the sale of a highly valued private business. Um, and when those happen, often one way that um, donors choose to handle their charitable giving is to start a family foundation or a donor advised fund. Um, and what we know right now is through increasing the estate tax exemption, doubling it, the re on the federal level, that reduces the incentive for individual donors to do that. And also by eliminating the deduction on the state level and offering a 5% tax credit, it also eliminates the incentive for people to do that. And I want to point that out because that's when really significant assets can be donated or dedicated to charity. So when we have been talking, and as I've done my best to look back at the testimony you've received so far, my impression is that a lot of that has really focused on people who give through their checkbooks annually, who are looking at their budget and saying, how much can I afford to give this year out of the extra income that I have on hand? And also, one of the times that nonprofits are really able to receive transformational gifts, gifts that help to do things like build homeless shelters and help fund new things <coughs> on hospitals and conserve significant amounts of land, happens at the, during these taxable events. And it happens when um, individual donors are able to start family foundations and able to start donor-advised funds. Um, and eliminating the deduction is going to eliminate the incentive to do that. So not only are we going to eliminate or reduce the amount that people are giving annually, but also when it comes to these opportunities to dedicate significant assets to charity that will continue to be dedicated to charity in perpetuity through a family foundation or a donor advised fund, there's much less incentive for people to do that. Um, so that that is my quantitative data that I have to share with you. I also have a set of qualitative data. And I want to make sure that you understand what this is. So this is um, 
This is opinion. So yesterday when I met briefly with Senator Cummings, and she was so kind to ask me to come in and talk with you all today, one of the things that we identified together is that while this committee has heard frequently from nonprofits, and as we all have been postulating about the behavior of major donors in response to these changes that you're proposing in H911, what I believe this committee hasn't had the opportunity to do yet is to hear from those major donors themselves. Um, and so in the 24 hours um, since I knew I was gonna be coming in to do this presentation with you, what I did was <coughs> take an informal survey. And so I simply emailed a, a large group of individual donors who I happen to know, major donors, and said, what do you think about this legislation? What do you, how do you think that this legislation is going to impact your charitable giving? And so these responses you have in front of you right now. Um, this is not a scientific survey. I can't guarantee that this is the majority opinion of major donors in the state of Vermont. But this is the voice, the voices of some major donors in Vermont. Collectively, the donors who are represented here probably represent about $8 million in charitable giving in the state of Vermont annually. In Vermont. In Vermont, right. I mean, certainly not every single gift from every single person on here is in the state of Vermont, but mo yes, mostly in Vermont. These are all, these, all of the people represented here are Vermonters. Um, if you take a quick look through these and this anecdotal feedback to the committee, what the, the theme that I think that you are going to see is that these are people who are dedicated philanthropists. They're as generous as they can possibly be. And tax considerations play a significant uh, role in their considerations of how much they give. And what most of these people are saying is, should H911 pass, I will still give. I am unlikely to give as much as I give right now, perhaps by far. Um, and again, this is unscientific data. This is, this is opinion collected in the past 24 hours. But it's major donors, and it's major donors who I think that this committee has not yet had an opportunity to hear from. And I wanted to try to help fill that gap in and attempt are, to solicit they, that opinion. Are they individuals, or are they? Corporations or they no, foundations? There are no corporations, they're individuals, and these are people who range from giving through their checkbook on an annual basis. Some of them have family foundations, some of them have donor advised funds. Um, What's the range of gift size? The range of gift size, these people give from $500 to some some of the gifts. I know that some of these donors have given as much as a, as a million dollars. Um, one-time gifts or cumulative? No, I'm talking about one-time gifts. I mean, cumulatively, much, much more. And the, the $8 million collective figure that I'm, rep I'm talking are about. These regular donors. Yes, yes, would be annual. It's not a one-time, I inherited some money from my mother and I'm going to give $1,000 to the dog shelter. Exactly. This is, I'm going to give money to whomever every year. Right. Right. It's yes. Sustaining donors. Exactly. Exactly. So, um, so and so, yes, yes. So sort of mixing the quantitative and the qualitative. My understanding, if we were to go with the governor's proposal, the change that would take place would be, as opposed to an 8.9 percent deduction, we get a 5 percent credit. So that's equivalent to like four, four and a half percent of your income. So you're saying a four and a half percent reduction in the amount, I've got this right, in the amount you're saving of the gift size, whatever, that's driving people's decision making, that loss of four and a half percent? Well, what, what, what these reactions are to is to the language that is in H911, as I understand it right now, which is the, the cap. The, yes, but I'm saying let's cap. assume we didn't do the cap. Mm -hmm. Would four and a half percent make a difference to people that they were given a thousand dollars? The fact that they're going to lose forty dollars on tax savings would that make a difference to them? Right. So, so I, that's not what that's not the question that I tested with this group. You know. So I'll I'll be honest about that. And again, I think that we can only <coughs> postulate. Um, but overall, 
I, what I believe the sentiment that you're hearing here is that um, it, both from nonprofits and from major donors, is that it doesn't, it, 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 it does not make sense to disincentivize giving in the state. Um, that, yes? No, I just, just, I just gave you red one side. But it almost sounds, on the fact that they don't completely like us, that um, they, like there's the something about this cutting back is saying we don't appreciate what you've been doing. That we're taking, you know, we gave you a benefit because we wanted to encourage you and we appreciate, you know, what you've done. And now we're cutting back on that and I'm getting the sense that they're not feeling that we know or understand or appreciate their contributions. Their, their contributions. I think that's accurate. Okay. I think that's accurate. Um, and I think that the other context for this as well is that you know every time um, a nonprofit, for instance, fails to have their um, grant from the state increased to account for inflation, or every time federal funding gets cut, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, um, these are the people who hear about it. You know, I will see those reductions or those lack of increases reflected in the proposals that I look at next week. Um, and so that's the environment in which these you're hearing these opinions, um, that there's a palpable sense of frustration that um, the you know, social safety net um, is not being supported and that private philanthropy is being expected to, um, under, uh, to, to, to support it, to create that foundation in a way that, um, you know, as these, these opinions proceed, as, as these individual major donors perceive, that the state and federal government is backing away from. So I would assume that the charitable groups on a national level have a very strong voice. And when this was, this is being driven by the feds, not us. And the feds not only reduced the top marginal rates, which I understand probably will reduce giving, um, but uh, they also changed the system so that more people will take a standard deduction and not be able to itemize. Was there pushback from the National Philanthropy Association? And did Congress listen at all to offset that by raising the margin from 50% to 60% on the big donors? Right, so, you know, as, uh, I'm not gonna be able to speak knowledgeably to the lobbying that happened in DC around the TCGA. But I can say that yes, I know that there were national associations of nonprofits and as well as organizations like the um, National Council of Foundations that pushed to um, ensure that the tax code incentivizes charitable giving. Um, you know, the degree to which they were listened to in DC, I, I can't personally speak to that. Um, I, I, I mean, well, I can only assume but yeah, it wasn't a, a, a very important voice. I know, yeah. but I, I, I think that there's moving parts in the federal law that reduce the incentive to giving. But I also think that, that, and I agree that a lot of the giving is being driven by the big donors, who very well may be affected by the allowed, who are going to continue to itemize and now can itemize 60% of their income versus 50%. And I'm wondering if that's an offset that charities are going to do just as well under this thing as they, on the federal level anyhow, as they would have beforehand. We may have a small state problem that's being driven by what the feds have done that we should fix, but that 60%, no one's been able to quantify. Everybody's talking about the downside. No one's talking about that upside for charity. But we won't know that, and the per perception is nine tenths of the law. I mean, think about it. If we, if there's a cap in place, and people feel that they're not being valued for the giving that that they've done, that is a significant disincentive to continue giving. You're talking about the house plan. 
Yeah. Okay. And I appreciate your point about the 60%. Um, I wish as well that I had data on how many taxpayers will be able to take advantage of that additional 10%. I don't. I can tell you my personal experience. I know just one family that is. Um, you know, I, I can't claim to know the you know how the ins and outs and the personal tax returns of every wealthy family in the state. Um, I only happen to know of one family that is that is will probably take advantage of that. If these donations we talked about the Humane Society, just that's where everyone in the opiate seems to be leaving money these days. But um, these go to environmental groups. These go to land conservation. Healthcare. These go to yes, the uh, the free health clinics. These go to an awful lot of programs that kind of they don't subsidize, but they enhance state funding so that the programs can run. We know that the BNAs have been running on their endowments, which is what's given to them right. for more than a couple of years. Right. Um, Yep. And I'm, I'm personally a little nervous about having that be cut right. because they are providing choices for care. Right. So Timing is, is a major issue in all of this. If you take a look, you know, you've been involved in any charitable organization in Vermont, and you look at when you receive your gifts, almost invariably you receive your gifts closer to the end of the year. Now, some would say it's Christmas. But I think it's the end of the tax year and the effect of that. And I, I, I think back to Fidelity and the charitable gift fund in our, with the largest charitable gift fund in the country. Mm -hmm. And you look at where the, the contributions come in, you see that tremendous spike in December. And those things are tax related. Make no mistake about it at, at all levels. And that's why I think this, this, this $500 cap that was, was proposed is a very bad idea. And if, in my mind, if through adjustments of uh, of marginal rates or some or 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 the the amount of the exemption in some fashion to be enable us to eliminate that I think it'll be certainly beneficial for charitable giving and I don't think we need to forget that charitable giving displaces a large amount of potential state spending and it's not just in health care and poverty programs and everything from the arts to libraries I mean it goes it goes throughout and I, I think this would be very short-sighted to have a cap like this. Okay. So, Sandra, oh, you're voting I'm yes? I'm agreeing with Randy. I have a motion for you to vote yes on that. Yeah. Okay. Do we have any questions for Christy? Thank you. Thank you so much this for your time, and thank you for been wrestling very, with us. This has been very helpful. <laughs> this is helpful. really great. I'm, I'm glad oh, you could yeah. come back. Thank you. Thank you for um, having me, and, this and is, um, thank you for what you're doing. Can I, can I ask her one final yeah. question? So I don't know if you heard the conversation before. If we chose not to do what the House or what the House did or the governor did and just said that the federal itemization could continue to pass through, would that be better from your perspective than either of the credit scenarios? Um, yes, I believe so. And one of the reasons is that I think there, I suspect there will be a greater tax benefit. Again, I'm not a tax accountant, but I believe that there will probably be a greater tax benefit. And also, um, to the senator's point, there you're not creating a negative perception around charitable giving, um, and there's less change. And I think that in this current environment, where we are all trying to keep up from day to day with the daily drama in DC and how it might affect us and the issues that we care about, um, having less change um, is probably a good thing. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Okay, committee, I think we could probably take a 10 minute break. Maybe natural resources can finish up whatever they're doing and um, just kind of catch our breath and then we'll come back and we're gonna make some decision points. I would like to get some of this resolved today. Oh wait, I, yeah, no, we've got somebody on at 3.30, right? Okay, so we have 10 minutes and then we're going back to aviation fuels.
Um, I'm just and yeah, well, it'll be an interesting break. Yes, it will. And then we're going to go back to this. I would like to get this decided so that Peter can draft, so we can come in here on Monday, go over that draft, vote out the tax bill, and proceed to the exciting world of data miners. Can, can, are we going to look at the difference if we were to change the tax bracket at the top and not collapse the top two but go to an 8.75? Um, I mean, at, at different levels. Like, we haven't talked about well, um, fluctuations, changing those. They're going back to, um, Jake is going to go back and run not reducing the, not reducing it the point two but reducing we know if we don't reduce it we got three and four so, it's, so if he does it point five or not point five but right one nine nine right what what does you know what does it take to get that extra four or five okay. okay or we can go the other way <laughs> that, that it's four thousand Forty-one. Yes, forty-one fifty or four thousand. Well, the house went kind of forty-one fifty. They went to the forty-one. They went fifty over the present. Right. Yeah. Right. Yes. Just wanted to bring this back to your attention, okay. Jenner. Jenner yes. did give us a clean copy. Okay. Okay. This is an age file. Remember, you had a discussion oh, with her. Maybe yes. I'll yes. talk. Yes. To Remind me of that when they come back in. And once um, before we go back to income tax, we'll vote that. Out. Okay. That'll take one minute. Okay. Are you going to, would you like? And why I think people. Oh, the question is whether or not Heritage uh, would make, maintain record sufficient of aviation gas dispensed so as to be able to keep track of the tax obligation and remit the tax to right. the agency. Good. You're in transportation. <laughs> and we have heritage here. So um, welcome and come on up and just introduce yourself to the record. Um, Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Timothy McColl. I'm a vice president at Heritage Aviation in South Burlington, Vermont. OK, you got the gist of our question. I did, yes, sir. Um, so, yes, we do record all of the transactions. However, uh, we don't meter the inbound fuel. Uh, we receive bulk loading of fuel, and uh, it doesn't actually pass through a meter. It's a, 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 a pretty intricate process where we measure feet and inches in the tank as we receive from a tractor trailer. So, I've done that on, yeah. on a realtor. I've done that on home fuel tanks. Sure. Mm -hmm. yep. In the gauge. That's, the temperature. Temperature. <laughs> that's, cor that's, that's correct. Yes. Corrected for temperature. That's yeah. a very big part of it. Thank you. So while while it does not pass through a meter, we do accurately record the in and the out. Um, oh, in order for us to provide that to the state, it would literally be a binder of, of uh, readings. It would be difficult to do, but we do have that information. And we very carefully track what comes in and goes out. So it's just a question, though. When you sell fuel uh, to, a, a, let's say, a plane flies in and you yep. fill that plane, Yes. Uh, how do you know how much fuel you put in it? Perfect. So we do on the outbound, on the sale of the fuel, we have a meter that is certified as accurate by the Agency of Agriculture. Mm -hmm. So every outbound sale of fuel is recorded on a certified meter. Mm -hmm. So, and we do maintain those records. But the, it's the inbound, or the other half of that transaction, mm -hmm. that is measured in feet and inches. So on the inbound side, is that what you remit the tax on? No, we the remit the tax sales the tax at the point of sale, oh, well, which the, is the outbound. Well, it's the point of sale that we're talking about, isn't it? Yes. Yeah, because that's, that, that's what we're looking that's at. That's what so we're looking for. When you're, you're measuring that, 
you would have a record of that in each case, and then you add up all those records, and those are the records that would be available for audit if necessary. Exactly. And then you remit the sales tax on that basis. Yes, sir. Right. Yeah. And all you sell is aviation fuel. That's correct. Yeah. Okay. So uh, you don't well, have to keep it separate. You you put it in a plane. Right. You've got the record. So if the feds come by and say, We're, how much yep. have you how much have you collected in aviation fuel tax? The town or the state whoever's getting paid that tax. Yes. Say, this is it. Okay. Those those records are maintained. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we do happen to also sell uh, oil, oil, but that that is not in bulk. It's in containerized sale. Okay. And you also pump jet fuel. We do. But there, you are not the, the one who's remitting the tax. The bulk, right? Airlines, uh, subsidiaries that do that, that that are responsible for that. Right. So about sixty five percent of the jet fuel that we handle. We don't own. We handle it for a fee, mm -hmm. and about 35 percent of the jet fuel that we handle, we sell, and mm -hmm. so we uh, collect the jets and well. remit yep. the sales tax on that sale. Okay. Well, it's correct. Um, jet fuel would be remit a sales tax. We do. There isn't. A, is there? A, maybe the agency of transportation, yeah. because I my understanding was that it's taxed on a different regimen. That, that, that your ad gas is taxed on the roughly 28 cents a gallon or whatever it is. But 6%. The, yeah, the 6%. <laughs> Plus the local. Excuse me, that's right, 6%, I take it back. Yeah. But that the jet fuel is a different tax regimen. And I thought it was all based on, on bulk providers, but are, maybe you're considered a bulk provider for that purpose. So just to clarify, the aviation jet fuel is taxed on a sales and use tax basis at 6% plus 1% local option tax in the case of Burlington. The jet, okay. the jet fuel. The av aviation gasoline is priced on a pennies per gallon yeah. basis. Um, so that's right. sort of the two reporting yeah. regimes. Yeah, I, I just, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. got it. Mm -hmm. so when, you, when you purchase uh, the jet fuel, um, do, you, what, do you pay a tax for the, on the purchase, the wholesale? No. Any tax on that or? No, that, that's a, a, a a purchase that we make and then we sell okay. on a retail basis the fuel and collect the tax there. Okay, it's only a tax at that time. Right. It's, it's, it's buy for resale, right. pay the tax and resale. Yeah. Right. Okay. Well, I think I'm not sure where the problem has. Have you seen the wording in this bill? And, I have. And you can live with that? Uh, so I have issue with the, uh, the, the new bill calls for us to uh, record and maintain meter readings and kind of the, the, the issue is that we don't have a meter. You don't have a meter, right. you have a stick. Right. Yes. Right. Uh, okay. But you I, could do that on that, but on the, uh, when you deliver it to the plane. Yes, and we do maintain those meters. Then you have those, yeah. so yeah. you have to ask which council. Okay. You see just what the wording is. So, yeah, don't, and yeah, which version don't, of this? You know what page that is? Uh, 54. Yeah. It's the second page of that, of the little card section. Okay. All right, we'll work with our drafter, and I'm pretty sure she's got your contact information. Yes. Yeah. Okay. She's not here. Well. Okay. So the issue for you is you don't have a meter coming in, so you right. can't do a meter reading. Right. When you put it out, which is the point at which you pay the, the tax, you do meter. Yes, that's correct. So we just need to ma make sure that we're not asking you to maintain your wholesale volume right. by meter. We are just asking you. To sound simple. Enough. Perfect. And uh, Thank you. I, I did want to say that uh, Heritage Aviation is an employee-owned company. We're 70 employees in Burlington, okay. uh, and uh, we're very happy to be here. I'm happy to come down and answer questions anytime. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Happy to have the airport there. Okay, committee. Before we go back to the happy world of taxes and charitable deductions. Um, when we voted 912 out this morning, we miss where's Senator Sorotkin? He's in the hall. You want to? Yeah, I need.
this is his this is his bill and his amendment. I need him here. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I've told him we neglected to amend with the cleanup language that Dan Carvey brought to us early on, probably because the bell was ringing and we were supposed to be on the floor. So I've asked Jen to just combine her amendment, which was striking section 11, which had been deleted, and there was some cleanup language she went over with us. This was all cleanup from health and welfare because of the bill, just things she caught after the bill came out. And then adding in Senator Sorotkin's language. So I'm going to ask him to withdraw his amendment. I don't know how to. He, he has to reconsider, Madam Chair, and, and, he, and it was reconsidered without objection. Oh, he, well, okay. He has to re and it was reconsidered without so now he's, now he's going to substitute. And when he, when he comes gets in, in the room, we'll tell him. <laughs> or he or he's sitting. Hey, by the way, just yeah. to, not to kill a dead horse, but you know, so we've just had this testimony. We could get rid of the, we could correct this provision in 917 very easily. Okay. Do you have a? Yeah, and basically on page 55. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, so it's the very last sentence, the record shall include daily motor fuel meter reading. Just, we'll just cross that out. Right. And, and okay. everything else is fine. Is that okay? Where, oh, she left. Michelle left. Yeah. I, I mean, I don't think it's for both jet fuel and gasoline on that page, isn't it? Yes, this is everything good. The dealers will keep record of all purchases. Yeah. Uh, okay. and, I was just out looking for Senator Campion. Yeah. It might. <laughs> okay. That would just, that would eliminate the problem. Except it might. <laughs> It might not if gasoline can be kept for that way. I don't know. Well, I don't know. he doesn't meter it until it wants to sell. But the gasoline doesn't. I think people are on that same in that same sense. Well, yeah, no, that's talking really about purchases. Meter reading. Yeah, it's talking about purchases, not sales. Right. Uh, yeah. Okay. When he purchases. Yeah. So okay. is that true for gasoline though? That that was my question. That that's gasoline we're talking about. Is that gas? It's jet fuel. Jet fuel. He does. He does okay. pay and and he, he, he does. He does. He does. He does he right. And the jet fuel is, is sold in Albany or Montreal or right. bulk to right. uh, companies that contract with the airlines. But the gasoline yeah. is on page fifty-five. Can that be metered there? Oh, no, that, that's what he's saying. Is he doesn't meter oh, it, he and he's the largest. Way. I mean, the, that that ab gas is sold at various airports around the state. Uh, what method they use, but we we're, we're dealing with it. that problem only arose because of, of something we got from the house, and it's, yeah. they don't go to the airport. Yes, we're going to have bills coming out. Well, if you stay, we can handle. Oh, okay, this one. I heard I, I heard I moved the reason. No, <laughs> actually, uh, we've, we've gone back to 917. 912? No, 917. Oh, aviation fuel. Senator Brock, who was our representative for transportation, says that if you go to page 55 and strike the first full sentence there, the record shall include daily motor fuel meter readings. That will solve carrying for aviation's <coughs> problem. They're still required to maintain records, but it just doesn't And, and they get that. the records it's when good. they pump it out, which is when they, that's what they're paying the tax on. And all of this is so we know how much aviation fuel tax or, yeah, or, yeah, the, purchase and use tax, we have to spend updating the airport to bring us in compliance with federal Purchase and use tax applies to jet fuel. Right. The per gallon fee applies to the 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 aviation, aviation gas. So we just take out that one sentence on yeah. the top of page 55. Right. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I'll, I'll, I'll double check with, with uh, yeah. the the trans to make sure that's our people. That's right. Yeah. We're still yeah. waiting for Aaron's rewrite, so we can't. We're dealing with this thing. We've got the two right. Okay, back to nine. Sure. Well, we've still got all the electric cars. Okay. So, I just want to make sure we've uh, yeah, the proper. Yeah, this is, this is not 
the best way we've ever done this bill because it came to us and so cut up pieces. Senator so Sorokin moved to substitute. Is moving to substitute. Wait, you has, then he have to move to reconsider his bill? He did that already. All right. He did that already. No objection. All right. So, Got Senator Sorokin, move that we substitute draft 1.2. For, for, for the three 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 six three 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 four zero. Yeah. yeah. Yes. All right. Yeah, that's no, what he moves. What, what, All right. For the Nine discussion. 12. This is the uh, pay parity. Pay parity. ACL. ACL. AC, this is all an ACL bill, and there was an you amendment. You voted against it. Yeah, I know. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Further discussion. If not, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? No. no. Okay, it's still 610. Okay. And now we're gonna, you can take that up. All gonna, right. Uh, now we're going back to taxes. Um, we're, yeah, we're, we're proposing to. Uh, oh, approve as amended. Yeah, yeah, okay. All right. Yeah. That was your move? Yes, it was my motion. All right. Further discussion? If not, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed say no. no. Okay. That's right. I should have voted no on the last one. Ah. Yeah, right. right. overall thing you like. Right. That's right. It was adding all those technical corrections that's, again. Yeah, that's one you're out of. <laughs> all right. We're back to 9-11. I don't know how we got all these sequentially numbered bills in here this year. All right. Okay, committee. I uh, yeah, you can notify Graham that we're back. We need Graham. We need Graham. I am getting yep. the sense, and we can do a thumbs up, thumbs down, that this committee is moving towards the administration's no cap on charitable deductions. All right. Senator McDonald, you're a no. Is, is that the only choice we have, one or the other? Uh, well, there, the there is another, there is another, <coughs> I'm just getting a sense of yeah. the committee. I, 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 where I am is I don't like the cap that the House put in. Mm -hmm. right. I don't know that I want to go the full distance to lifting it entirely, to removing it entirely. And Graham <laughs> told me that he has some numbers on the concept of just passing the deduction through. Okay. As another. He's on his way. Make it more. Yeah. Maybe more. Maybe more and less progressive. <coughs> Maybe less. Yeah. 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 Right. Yeah. Because it makes the deduction more valuable. Yeah. I, I don't want. I don't want to hurt the charities. Yeah. But I also I'm not sure I believe that doing the cap idea is really going to make a big difference to whether someone gives a hundred dollar gift or not, you know. I know. I'll better go with the big deductions. Perception. I think that was the, the interesting thing with the comments are, is the right. perception that yeah. we don't, the government doesn't appreciate what they're doing. And they are. I'm not afraid of the caps. Even when they itemize, the deduction is being made the is less likely to do I'm if, sure if there's no ability to itemize on the state level. They don't pay the that's taxes, going away they pay it in if right. we don't do something. Our state right. needs it. That's why I'm saying one other choice would be to give them the value yes. of the deduction. Because they, they can deduct it. Right. As opposed because to a credit. Because they get credit. Yeah, for. and I think, as I said, I think that'll be more yeah. expensive, but we'll so see, what, see what we come to. Just the way of the appropriations committees. Key and all that is what effect that's going to have on, on rates. Because in order to be able to do that and still be able to fund it, you may have to either fool with the amount of the exemption or or somehow the alter rates. the rate. Right. Either one. So of we, have, we have a bunch, we have a bunch of problems here. We got the social security thing. Yep. The charitable thing. We got the new 18 million dollars. We got to find money for. 18 million. The one up for the special ed that just came out. Oh, okay, but that's fine money for school. that. That's school. That's school. That's, that's the school. next section. That's the next section. Well, we'll and nothing, no, we I, we no one has told us to find 18 million additional dollars. 
We're not right. being told to level the property tax or keep it at one and a half percent? I believe the bulk of that work is being done in the Ed Committee. Oh, really? Yeah. I don't. Yeah. Okay. They're the ones that are doing the special ed and the ratios and they're talking with the administration about a five-year plan. Um, so we're you know, so our bill 911 is just going to be the income tax windfalls and social security travel deductions and the whole other issue. And funding we, general fund. No, you? yeah, we will have to put uh, the yield numbers in there, so we will have a nexus to property taxes. And it will depend on how things work out at the end. I will check this. No one has told me to find eight, $58 million. Okay? If they want me to do that, then they should have told me. Okay. Right. This, this bill is just about what we're going to do with that $30 million. The first section of this yeah. bill is what we're going to do we're to paint adjust over our the tax of paintings. codes. Yes. And then we're going to paint a new one. Yes. Okay. 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 Well, he was going to be back here at four. So. Painting, oh, he was. So yeah. Yeah. People. Uh, yeah. That's what we got from the feds. We're going to take $30 now. million to paint that white. Well, we have to decide on And then we're going to have a new painting on well, top, which will cost us yeah. Has anyone told you More this money. committee is supposed to find $58 million to bring the tax rates to zero? Okay, no one's told me that. So you're going to find that in education down the hall? What's that? You're going to find that down in education down the hall? Yeah, I don't think so. Did, <laughs> has it gone up since yesterday, the 58? No, no, it hasn't changed since yesterday. <laughs> so, I'm going back over so we got another 36 again. minutes to hold our paint. Right now, if we put out the yield, as it, it, the yield, well, we will have to, the yield is set on what the house did. So we will have to make adjustments to the yield if we do nothing with the property tax. But I haven't heard anyone wanting to make the changes you gotta that the low, house did. A low yield. The, the yield number that you just described, so you get something to yeah. conference on. No, we've got to have a yield number. Yeah. And, or there's no property tax next year, which yep. is the solution. Um, but, no, and I talked to administration this morning and told them I thought there was some money to be had, but no one has asked. I mean, I, how this is going to sugar out is anyone's idea, <clears throat> but nothing has come this way. But this, I think, we do need to get out. So the other thing we have to do is figure out what we're going to do to make up for allowing more contributions to go through. Pardon? We have to figure out what we're going to do if we go ahead with letting the contributions go forward. That right. Yeah. Calls, so then we have to figure out how we're going to make up for that. This well, is, if we do six the governor's plan, Graham says we've got an eight million dollar right. hole. We, we can get three to four of that by not so collapsing the tax rates, right. which makes it more keeps it more progressive. And the administration has actually asked us to do that. Oh, no, wake me up. I'll vote no and go back so, to asked the tax department to go back and see if we could lower the rates. If, according to Graham's numbers, we make $34 million. If we don't lower the rates, that point one. So if we don't lower, lower it point oh one, will we make up enough? We could not. Or we could also have not lowered the rates for everybody. We could lower the rates for middle income people and not lower the rates for higher income We could people. do that. Something like that. Yes. We could do that, and um, Bram's got a couple of runs that he's done of different right. options. We could also not deduct Social Security all the way up to 60000 which is Senator McDonald's. Okay, we could okay. take that down. Or, as the yeah, tax department me. pointed out, what was it? The, uh, it's 4000 
per, and it was forty one hundred. Yeah, it's forty one hundred. Yeah, the, well, the the house was four slight. Four thousand or forty one fifty. Right, but there was a 4,100 number, and I right. forget, and the house went slightly above. They went to 4,150 per deduction. Yeah. Uh oh. The big guns. Bringing the posse here. with them. <laughs> You're not doing this issue. No. Yes. You can borrow me. For two. You well, want me to leave this discussion in we'll charge of seven uh, dollars? Okay. Right. Yeah. Now we're ready. Party. <laughs> Party on. Yeah. One more bill's house and still a chair of turn. All in favor say aye. Yeah. 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 I was like, you know, where can I go where they won't find me? <laughs> Party on, <hard>, guys. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, what the heck? You know that was the name of George yeah, W. Bush's yeah. biography, autobiography, decision really? points. Didn't he call himself the it designer? Is it, it's 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 but I got one. I got one. Slightly averse to the title. Cummings is the decider. One date at April 25th? Yes. Yeah, the one date. Yeah, so it's kind of April 25th. Yeah. The decision points, and then what I've handed out today is April yeah. 27th. Huh. Mm -hmm. Say aye. Uh, <laughs> 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 All right, what'd you do after that? <laughs> no, we we have it somewhere on there. We have this. <laughs> that is physically impossible. <laughs> okay, we're set. Oh, you're drawing a snowman again? We haven't heard it. We've gone a little bit. Graham, tell us what we asked you to find the other day. Yeah, so Graham Campbell, GFO. So I'm going to present um, three things today. Um, and, and just while you were not here, we did a thumbs up. We've got at this point, it looks like a 5 2 that they would like to do more charitable deductions. Now, there's, there's no cap. 
there's up to the 10,000 cap. There's, I'm sure, some room in between. We asked Jake, who is back, if he could run. Um, if we didn't reduce the rates a full 0.2, if we reduced them maybe 0.199 or 1.15, but something short of two, could we make up? We know we've got three to four if we don't collapse the the rates. We've got three. Yeah, we've got three. So we need four more, right? You would five probably, million. Yeah. yeah. Uh, probably around four to five million dollars. Four to five million. We so also we talked five. about uh, reducing the amount of the personal exemptions. There's yes, way yes. To down to the four. Yes. Okay. There was two numbers. There was a 4,000 you gave us, which has been the federal and then there was a 41, because I remember, the, the, that's what the House did. But there was another, because I was thinking the House might split the difference, but they actually went 50 up from the other number. Do you remember? The, cur the, the standard, or the personal exemption of the government plan is $4,000. Yeah. Currently, what carries through Vermont is a federal personal exemption, and that is equal Last year was four zero five zero. So okay, that's what. You're that's talking. what I had. I knew there was a third number, and I was thinking that the house went marginally, but slightly above that number. So they came up with the forty one fifty. Yes. Okay. So there's we can do some moving in there too. All right. Yes. <coughs> okay. So. Um, I heard from the committee um, two requests yesterday to examine um, looking at Social Security and also charitable giving. I also have a document that I'll share afterwards about um, showing, I did those examples yesterday. I was asked um, to um, add some columns with the federal tax okay. liability changes, yep. just for two of them. But I'll begin with um, this first page of proposal. So I heard two proposals yesterday. One, on the, or both on the Social Security front, just as a refresher, the current proposal, which, which is in 9-11, is an exemption of taxable Social Security benefits from Vermont income taxes. For those people earning below $45,000 in AGI, single, and $60,000 AGI, married, they will receive 100% Social Security um, exemption, and then it's phased out over the next uh, $10,000. In the H-911, this uh, proposal is funded fully. Um, the administration, um, with their Social Security exemption, um, phased it in one-third each year. And that was not necessarily in their income tax proposal. No, it was funded in the budget, yes. which it no longer is. So we don't have that money to play with it. So just a refresher, if you remove the Social Security exemption totally from 9-11, you would have about four and a half million dollars to work with. Okay. Okay, what, so in order to get the everything we need to do the complete charitable, we would have to totally remove it. You could. That's you one could. option. Yes. Mm -hmm. What the, the proposal I heard yesterday, one was to lower those thresholds. So Instead of a 45,000, 60,000 threshold, it would be 40,000 and 50,000 um, and see how much money that gave you. So if you did that, so like the, like the proposal above, it would phase out over the next $10,000 and it would be fully funded in the first year as opposed to the third, third, third. Mm -hmm. If you do that, relative to H911, you'll have about $1.7 million extra to work with. How much what? extra to work with? Oh, 1. 1.7. Like this this table here. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Did yeah. you say phasing it in? Uh, no phase in. Oh, but it phase, so there's no phase in. Right. It like, it's just like 9 11. It's yeah. just that the income thresholds now are lower. Right. Because this is now a cash windfall that we are allocating. And it was phased in, I think, because you couldn't get 
couldn't get the full amount out of the budget this year, I don't know that the sources of it were identified for the next two years. So there was a, we didn't know at that point what we were going to have to cut or not find if there were extra revenue. What, okay. if, we, what if we took this first table and phased it over three years, what would that 1.7 go to? Uh, we've hypothetically, we we divide by three, but a little bit, it would grow a little bit over time because, like I said over and over on Social Security, that that cost grows over time. Right. So it wouldn't quite be a th divided by three, but it would be pretty divided close. Divided by three? Would yeah, so 1.7 divided by three. Each though. year you'd get a third of one point. Right. You would need to find an addition, that additional every single year. So in the first year, if you By phasing in an income tax cut, we have to pay more? So. No. Yes. Relative to 9-11. You're paying a third each year yeah. rather than, than paying the full um, so 1.7 or 3.2 this year. We're taking it, we're funding it with the present windfall. That windfall is going to be here next year. It's, you know, it, there'll be some slight changes, but basically, whereas if you're funding it out of the general fund, you only funded it for one year, you, you have to come up with less of a cut in a zero-sum game to fund it this year, so there's an advantage. But to us, we're not going to see a, you know, that amount of cut in all probability in charitable giving. We, we, we've got the money now, and if we don't allocate it wherever we allocate it, or take it from, that's where it's going to be next year. We're not, I can't see what the advantage is to doing it for three years. If we squeeze ourselves in the next two years for what right. we've done, the next legislature squeezes why, itself for what it, we've done. Yeah. But for phasing it in, in the first year we would be saving more money. So that 1.7 should be higher. Yeah, we phased it in because it came out of the general mm -hmm. fund. All right, and in order to do that, they cut the uh, caregivers to quadriplegics and a couple of those social service programs. Right now, we have a windfall. We have a pot of money. Right. So it's there. As far as we know, the same pot of money will be there next year. There's not going to be any more next year or any less need for charitable giving. So there's no advantage to phasing it in. Well, there is an advantage, Madam Chair, is that we can spend more money this year, build the budget, and let the next legislature so have to deal, deal with, with the it, fact that, we, the budget. That, that we've already committed to spending right. something that we have before they ever showed up. Yeah, we haven't funded it. We can fund it all this year because we're, we're figuring out how much we're giving back and to whom. We've got a pot. If we give all this money away now, we allocate it or we choose not to collect it, either way, then next year we're not going to have the money in this allocation. It will have to come out of the general fund budget. We've got a lot more elasticity at this point than we will next year. And it's not going to give us any more money to deal with. I think we did two. No, not turning it up anymore. We're turning it next Monday. Didn't they? Right, 9-12. No, I talked to Bloomer. I'm going to turn it on Monday. Oh, I'm still working on some people. I'm just wondering if okay. you're still? Still trying to see if we can find a compromise. Oh, all right. Well, yeah. he, said, he said I could do that. All right. We're going to have to turn it immediately. No, but don't lose it. So. <laughs> Me? <laughs> <laughs> Anybody in this building? Okay. Yes, Senator. No, I just go back to what we're back on. Back to what we're on. So I can't. Is there an advantage, Graham, to facing it in? What are the numbers? Well, I said divide the 1.7 1. 1. 7 7 by 3. three. So is that the, the total tax yeah, impact? Yeah, right. You would multiply it by 3. So multiply. multiply. Yeah. That's the, so this is the savings relative to 9-11. Okay. So if you, yeah, it's difficult to think. Well, if you only did it a third, a third, a third, it's a third of that. We phased it in. 
over three years. You, so the, so the Social Security exemption right now costs 9-11 about four and a half million dollars. Wow. Relative to that, this costs 1.7. So it's done. Right, it got it. Yes. Right. If we drop it down, then it costs 1.7. So that gives us. No, you have a 1.7 to work with. Additional. Oh, to work with. That's yes. what we're That's saying. Additional money. That's okay. additional money. So we've got that additional money to put towards charitable deductions. It's there one still option. is no benefit to phasing it in that I can see because... Just in general, in general a phase-in of the exemption period yeah. would be you would have you would have to find the money, yes. the additional third every year. Every year. So that that is the that happens with any phase in. Right. May I just ask the administration folks why they decided to? Do you know why the administration decided to phase it in? It was. It was. I just don't recall. It was a finance. Andrew Stein, Research Commons Department of Taxes. It was a finance and management decision. It was a budgeting decision. They found okay. that money in the it budget. Was, it okay. was in the budget, yeah. not in this. So they didn't have to pay for it. Well, they paid for 30 years. Right, so they didn't have to pay yeah. for what they yeah. were, what they were actually proposing. Allegedly delivering. I got it. And the House said rather than <clears throat> doing that, doing we're going to show and be trending. They were going right. to collapse the pay rates, to, you know, get the extra money yeah. and pay for it now. Seems and like the part right way of the it. way they did that was to cap the charitable deductions <laughs> so that they had the money to do it. So if we don't collapse the charitable deductions, we have um, taken it on faith, an $8 million hole that we have to fill. Yeah. Now if we go back, don't collapse the tax rates and leave the 0.2% reduction. Or move it down. We save three to four million, right? Relative to 9-11, if you don't collapse the bracket, just the collapse. Just the collapse. Yes. Oh. If we don't lower the tax rates, we make 34 million. Yes. That's all the tax rates. That's all the tax yes. rates. Or we could lower the tax rates for some people and not for another option. That is and another option. And therefore, you could reduce the exemption. Right. The 4150, you could reduce it down to something like yes. 4,000 or above, right. which in some ways right. is less obvious, right. uh, whereas uh, than fully with the individual rates. Especially if we're increasing the EITC, if they mm -hmm. keep it at 4,000. Right, that's the other place that the right. money got spent, was increasing the earned income tax credit, because that's all state dollars. That's in addition to the I mean, funds. I, I lean toward the exemption uh, myself, again, because it's entirely new, and it, it, it still shows the individual tiers with lower rates. So it's, that part, the favorable part remains. Um, and that this this table here, these these tables show you essentially compared to 9/11, mm -hmm. how these groups would be impacted by that. So it makes sense that if you start if you lower the thresholds, the people who were previously getting that exemption under 9/11 are going to pay more relative to 9/11. So right now, the group between 40 and 50, 45 and 50 thousand is receiving an average benefit in 9/11. Just from the Social Security, of about two hundred ninety-nine right. dollars. Right. If you change this proposal, and you lower that. That benefit would go away. Right. Right. We want to keep. So those people would. So relative to two thousand seventeen is a different story. This is just compared to nine eleven. Right. So. Right. Okay. What is it relative to two thousand seventeen? Do you have? You said you had those runs? So relative to 2017, these people, the, the people who would be getting the tax cut, mm -hmm. um, well, ju it depends what you think. If, it, if you're thinking about relative to 2017, just introducing a Social Security benefit is different from relative to 2017 and doing H911 and this. That's true. We're, yes. This. There's just a, a whole lot more at play here. Right. So in, in general, the groups here that you see that are being impacted, <coughs> they are being helped by probably three things in 9-11. They're being helped rel relative to 2017. They're being helped with the lowering of the tax rates. Mm -hmm. 
they're being helped by the uh, raising of the personal exemption, and some might be helped by the earned income tax credit, probably not that many. So relative to 2017, the people making probably below 45,000 are, it's well, actually, low, on average, it's a, it's, a, it's a relative benefit to those taxpayers. The first two tiers, if you've got a $24,000 exemption, you don't have any taxable income at this point, right? If you've got it, if it's the federal level, you, if you can take an exemption at twenty-four thousand and your income is twenty, if you were if you were making twenty-four thousand in social security benefits or any or any income, I mean, if you had twenty in any income, yes, but your social security would be presumably some piece of that, yeah, yeah. yeah so your let's see, if you made twenty-four thousand and social security was say. 12 to 15 of it, yeah. then the Social Security part of it would not be taxed right. already. Right. That's the current law. But, but the rest, the 9,000, would yes. be taxed. But that's such a low but income. But under the new tax rate, none of it would be taxed, right? If you were 24,000, if you have a, a deduction, a personal, you know, a standard deduction of 24,000 for a couple. On your federal taxes. On your federal would. taxes. It would, yes. Okay. You would have no tax liability. But there will be, but that's before your AGI, so you would have no state tax liability, would you? You it's would. It's above the AGI. It, these these provisions would, would interact with each other. So if you were someone making $24,000 and you had $15,000 of Social Security yeah. income, that income right now is not taxed. is not the right. fifteen thousand is not taxed, right? And so that would, that carries through to Vermont. Right. Under this proposal, that change nothing changes there because those That's people are already right. the AGI. Okay, right. I've got it mixed up. The yeah. AGI, the personal exemption, you'd have no federal tax liability. Right, but that person making twenty four thousand um, dollars under this proposal would likely benefit under H nine eleven would benefit from the earned income tax credit. That's expansion. what I was thinking. Yeah. So I can't say for sure whether they would have tax liability or not. It but they still is a not very much money to live on. Um, and okay. if they have kids, they would benefit from the expanded personal exemption. Can I ask a question yes. on your chart here? I I don't, average change relative to the 911. Yes. This is for the, re, the proposal to reduce the, uh, the, the maximum from 60 to 50 and from yes. 45 to 40? Yes. So is, and the AGI group is for a joint file or a single file or both? Any, any filer. And so you're saying people in the, by just changing that people in the 45 to $50,000 category on average would lose would pay two hundred twenty nine dollars more in taxes. <laughs> those who had a change in their taxes. So this would be those people who were who were previously under nine eleven hypothetically receiving that social security benefit would no longer be receiving the full benefit or not receiving it at all. And so their change in taxes relative to that to nine eleven would be two hundred twenty nine dollars. So hypothetically, if you're someone on social security and you're making fifty thousand dollars. Under H911, your benefit just from the Social Security benefit on average was $229. And do we know for that group, for instance, what their average benefit saving, tax savings would be? It's $229 less than something. What was the, the original figure for that group? Oh, um, compared to? In 911 for that group. Under the original. Just the Social Security benefit? Yeah, it was. Well, you're saying that we're going to change the program parameters, and that particular group is going to lose $229. From what figure are they going to lose $229? They're going to lose $225 relative to if you enact 9-11. Right. Yes. And what would they have gained under 9-11? Oh. Uh, let's see. Probably, probably very close to that number. So, they're just, so that, that group is going to be wiped out. They will, well, you're no longer giving them the exemption that they had in 9 11. So, okay. yes. 
So they may benefit, this group may benefit from other provisions in 911. Oh, I know, but we're just talking about due to the change you're proposing, yes. you're proposing one. But he's not. No. You've asked him. No. <laughs> So if we want to lower the benefit so that the top isn't oh, 60,000, all right, um, you're moving it to 50. And moving it to 50, we would leave that top group would be paying to $229 more relative to 9-11. Relative to 9 yes. All right. Right now, I assume they're paying the $229, right? It's, it's taxable. Could I, mostly, yeah, the, uh, that one. But about that, yeah. yeah. I, I guess I would prefer, if we're going to reduce this, I would prefer to um, not lower the the threshold from 60 to 50 or from 45 to 40. We leave the threshold where it is so more people can take advantage of this, but maybe spread the percentage of deduction each of them in the program get. That's what Randy was saying. Can we do it no. that way? Huh? No. Who's doing it on the, the whole no. the whole group? Oh, yeah. I'm just talking about social security. Oh, I got you. I got you. Instead of eliminating people from this would keep those people in and give everybody in the program a little bit less Well, savings. you could start your ramp down. You could start your ramp down earlier. Yeah. Wouldn't it make sense, though, instead of... Yeah, well, I'd have to do that. I mean, I'm not saying we shouldn't talk about this, because obviously we want to talk about this, but it seems to me like we should be looking at some of the other options as well in terms of the tax rates and those kinds of things, to, and then come back to this, because depending on how much we can save by doing other things, that would be us an indication of whether we want to really change these, the Social Security or not. Okay. If we could save the money in other ways or regain the money in other yeah. ways. Just saying, if we just focus on one thing the whole time, it's kind of doing it in a vacuum. So we know we can, we know we have uh, choices. trusting the folks that gave us the numbers. If we went down back to the 4,000, we could do it for exemption. That, would hit mostly families with dependents. Right. If we if we, didn't didn't, if we didn't reduce the tax rate, Jake, did you were you able to do a run on 1.999 or 0.199? I didn't. Um, fiddle with the marginal rates, but I did design something that I thought captured. Uh, what you were thinking while I was testifying. Um, Such as? Uh, do you want it, it? It'll take a minute to go through it. Yeah. Very much. Stretch your legs. Come on up. Jake Feldman, Tax Department. Mm -hmm. um, so, I should I probably point out initially that, um, and you can see, sit me back down if you don't like this. Um, so what I'm about the, the in this plan, um, which has basically all these elements we've been talking about, Social Security is only paid for at 33% for the first year. It is paid for through income taxes. It's not elsewhere in the budget, but it's it's the administration's very initial proposal, first year 33%. So in out years, you'd have to pay, you know, another third and then another third. But what's the advantage of doing that? It costs less than five million. This, yeah, this, this year, year. This year, 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 Yes, I, we, if you give me another years, couple yeah. hours, I can think of some ideas for the next right. couple of years. But you may have it. 2000. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, Yes. It's obliging us to make the next legislature to make tax cuts and then figure out how they're going to pay for it. Right. That's why the House did it. And we get the credit for having done it. So, okay. If you're not going to take it, you weren't able to do the runs. I, I did a run. Yes. Okay. 
And, and this, uh, this, what I'm about to tell you, rate would act is actually slightly above revenue neutral. It has a half a million dollars of extra revenue. Um, and it would be the following, and these are all elements that you've been talking about. Um, the exempt personal exemptions would be $4,000 each, which helps families bring them back to what they would have been. The top marginal rate is back up to 8.75%. There's no collapsing of the top two brackets. Um, we still have five brackets, five rates. Um, Social Security would be paid, the, the exemption value would be 33%. Um, H911 had it fully paid for. Standard deduction would be the same as we've been talking about. 6,000 for singles, 9,000 head of household, 12,000 joint yeah. filers. Earned income tax credit, same as we've been discussing, 32% to 35%, and then charitable contributions, all of them would be eligible for a 5% credit. Okay, but where you got the money then is you got the two million, three million, by not collapsing the rates, or the, the yeah. yes, and you got the rest of it by kicking the can down the road and only funding a third of Social Security this year. Everything else was, and you took back to the, to the four thousand. How much did you make by going back to the four thousand? It was a couple million dollars, I think. Can um, you confirm that? I can go back and confirm it's around two million dollars. Okay, you can email that to Cheryl. Can I can I ask another question? Um, did you do any runs in the preliminary development of the governor's proposal, looking at the EITC instead of going to thirty-five percent, going thirty-two to thirty-four, thirty-three? What's the my, my colleague who was just here, um, Andrew Stein, did um, experiment with the EITC, and the, the cost of an additional percent is not much. Okay. So go, going from 32 to 35 only costs something like 2.9. It costs about 2.9 to go from 32 to 35. So oh. if, you went to, okay. if you went to 33 or 34. We're not going to sneak it out of there. So yeah, no, I know we're not. I just want to know how much it was. If it was two. Yeah. 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 No. I, I think that it's all on our sheet somewhere. Ask all these questions. Oh, yeah. Okay. So the, the exemption winds up giving us about $2 billion, is that right? Yes. And that would be enough to, to be able to do a third easily. And kick the can. Yeah, yeah. I like that idea. You do? I don't. No. I don't. Okay. Yeah. Really? So I'd like to be able to do, do it all at, at yeah. once and, and, and fully fund it instead of kicking yeah. it down the road, yeah. frankly. Because yeah. there's not going to be more money there next year. We won't be able to deal with it next year in the same way. No. I mean, unless you have, have you mentioned you have, quote, another, other ideas as to what okay. as to a funding source. But I mean, they're, they're my own personal ideas, so I need to really, you know, talk to, to Kai and, and others to, okay. to see if they're doable. But there are other, there are other parts of income taxes that are moving a little bit that could be that could be thought about to possibly raise more revenue in the next couple of years. Um, and it's kind of deep in the weeds, but if you give us a little bit of time, we might be able to. Yes, that's the one thing we don't have is very much time. And also cognizant of who you work for. We, we so also, I don't want to put you in a very difficult position. Um, and I think we can have Graham We have do time to do things. Work to, do. Yes. to learn things that, are, that fall between what the Senate and the House might come up with. Right, okay. We don't have time to and, do things on the other side of that line. No, and we may very well. Um, the other possibility is that rather than unlimited charitable deductions, that we could raise the, the deduction up to 20,000, the, the credit. It probably isn't it's enough. Not, it's not nearly enough. Because the, the object of this is, the, the, frankly, the, the benefit of the charities are the big donors. And it's the big donors who make tax decisions, at least in part, uh, on the basis of getting the benefit. And, and, and for the charities, getting large donations is what makes the difference. Probably right. And those who are charitable are ones that don't 
truly charitable are ones who don't get tax deductions. And they're well, this is this one's it's a tax credit, okay. and they are going to be able to get it if they give a fifty dollar or a hundred dollar or anything else. So in that sense, it is progressive. People that gave before but didn't make enough to itemize. Um, what if, for example, I don't know who I'm asking this to. Well, maybe Graham. Graham. I think Jake. Well, we'll switch. Uh, um, again, we're just, uh, we're just jumping around around here, but. Anybody that wants to chime in with an idea. Yeah, what about if we, what if we, we, and then we lowered the rates, the tax rates by 0.2% for everybody? What if we only lowered the tax rates 0.2% for people making $200,000 or less? This is something that I've looked at. Okay. So if you don't have the charitable credit, you lose $8 million, or you right. need to find $8 million. One way that gets you very close is not collapsing the top two brackets and not lowering the rates to a full 0.2 for the top two brackets. So if you lower them, I think 0.1, it gets you to $8 million approximately. So basically, we would be doing 0.2 for everybody from a half a million dollars down or so. Uh, what we sub lowering from two hundred optic standpoint, I, I think is is a beneficial thing. Yeah. Uh, if you if you do that and get eight million, that sounds as though that might solve a, a lot of the problem. Yeah. So what you want to say that again? So I got Randy and Anthony agree. <laughs> I know well, I'm like the next most conservative said. member on this committee besides me. So I, I, I would like to con like confirm this, but I did this a couple days ago and it was okay. very close to eight million. Okay, um, repeat it, please. You would you would not collapse the top two brackets, mm -hmm. and you would not lower you would lower the rates for everyone, but you would only lower them 0 0.1 for the top two brackets. Oh, okay. So that's a million in infinity and half a million to a million. That's for the top. Uh, the top brackets start at for married start at about four hundred thirty thousand, and then okay. the next lowest one is about two thirty, I think. Right? So they would get a, those those four hundred et cetera up would get a one percent rate cut. Point one percent. Point one percent rate cut. And everyone, everyone else would get a point two. two. And you can hmm. keep the exemption at forty one fifty. That seems fair to me. Everybody gets the tax. Is that a solution? We Great. Yeah. So the, the and how much we get eight million from that? You would get that's that's my tentative. Okay. But what the effect of that is is that so higher income people get less of the, right. the tax but change. They get more but it's, the it's it's just in a different way. So the charitable credit right now, the cap is impacting only high income taxpayers. Right. And so we take the cap off. So the cap off benefit to them, and we just. We the don't collapse the top two rates rate from what they got. It's not like they ever asked us. Now, what you've done is you've now you down dealt with, presumably, you've dealt with the charitable issue. We still have the social security issue to deal with. No, that's that's, 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 that's built in. in. That's built in. You wouldn't have to okay. deal with that. Fully. Okay. Yeah, right. this, that, they're, full they're covered. So full pay. Yeah. Full pay. Yeah. Full pay. Yeah. All right. Good. We're going to get out of here on stage. Wow. Okay. If we can agree to this, Greg right. can run the numbers on Monday morning. And Peter, if you can draft this, because I don't think we've done a whole lot of changes. We've just changed the Oh, yeah. We wouldn't be collapsing the top brackets. We wouldn't be collapsing the top brackets, and we wouldn't be, and we would just lower the top two brackets by 0 0.1 rather than 0 0.2. And we and haven't changed the deduction from. We'd have. Uh, we changed we'd the house. Have idea, right. Would be 41. We no, we have not changed. We haven't Anything changed. Regarding no. Okay. No. So you still got the better family exemption, yep. which helps families. So it allows us to fund Social Security. Like yeah, fund Social Security. Fund Social Security. It full. Preliminarily. Preliminarily. It's late. Um, I'm not what this does is Jake, <laughs> Jake showed you that example of the taxpayer who made six hundred thousand yeah. dollars and didn't make any charitable contributions under H nine eleven. They were getting a tax cut. But they were pretty guilty anyway. Mm -hmm. But <laughs> yeah, the person who ended up, the person who gave charitable contributions, did better under the governor's plan. So this would effectively 
change that. The person who is no longer giving, the rich, the wealthy person who is giving, who's not giving, who's not giving, would pay more under the, this proposal we're discussing here than okay. 9/11. That's good. And the person, That's the rich, the wealthy person paying, doing more in charitable contributions, would pay less. Like yeah. yeah. Peter, you look anxious. Well, I just. Um, uh, I sense a consensus coming. I would love five minutes in the yes. chair to just make sure I understand what you're looking for in a draft Monday. Could, could you just go to this last chart? Okay. Point. I'm around. You might not have a thing, and they just I know. He would like to share Before you leave, I would like, I would like okay. just five minutes to make sure I understand just what you're looking for. Feel free to call me all weekend. To Something. But you want to talk just before you leave. If, before we if leave. I could, just for five minutes here to make sure I've got I have that. nothing going on. 400,000. <laughs> right. Exactly. Right. 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 I think I will finish with Graham, and we'll let Peter come up, and he can walk us through and see if he understands what we're doing, which may help us understand if we understand what we're doing. <laughs> just want to skip to go through oh, that. Oh, you wanted to go what's, through that last what's the lot? What are you going through? It's like, it's from, is the idea of letting the charitable deductions flow through, it's more expensive to do that? Yes, it's more expensive to do that. Um, it would cost about one point or $11.9 million. And this is because um, the deduction is worth more to high-income taxpayers than the, the credit. And right. so by doing this, it's a bigger, it's a bigger advantage to, um, the, the, to, to big gifts, basically. And so the credit, if you um, if you're in those high income tax brackets, your effective tax rate is higher than 5%. Right. And so the deduction is worth more to you than the 5% credit in the right. governor's plan. So, right. and this assumes that everyone will be able to keep this, do, everyone would still take the standard deduction as well, even if you itemized, you, not itemized, even if you deducted your charitable giving. Mm -hmm. Good idea. Which one are you looking for? I'm looking for my summary so I can tell people. We can go through this in a logical order. That's one, but I don't want to know the time. Yes. Yeah, I've got, I've got one, which is fine. You still do? I think I can make sure what I can do. You're here as long as you want us to do. We're not going to vote the tax bill okay. out. We're going to wait for a draft to vote that on Monday. So I have nothing else to wait for from your committee? Uh, uh, no. That's it. Okay. Well, this might have uh, something. No. No. I'll talk to him about it later. No. Yeah. He doesn't. So here's an option for the legislative council. I know it's late. I have this sheet in front of me and I'm just gonna run through it quick to make sure I understand it. Well I've got uh, well it looks like the section by section. Yeah, that's what I've got. Okay. Um, uh, so uh, on the personal income tax changes, the exemption staying at 4150. Sorry, Peter, slow you down. I just see that. I just want to make sure I have that sheet. It's this one. I'm sorry. I was just, uh, I know it's like, no, it's. Section. Can I have it? Sure. Sure. I have it. I have extra copies. Thank you. We were, uh, thank you. Yeah. Draft 1.1. 1. 1. Yeah. yeah, that's right. Draft 1.1. Okay. Numbers don't work. Oh, yeah, we have a few things we might need to do that would make the house happy on Monday. Remember the tax bills? Yes. Well, we could add, ask that they, um, but we're cutting them in half, so we don't need it. But we, uh, no, they wanted to break it out. And the guy that does, it's not Niren, but that does the tax bill forms, said he could lay it out like this right now. You do town, school under each other. He said oh, he could lay the, them out Nimrick. side yes. by side. Nimrick. So we avoid the two, ask, yeah. so two tax bills. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So and we could board. ask that the tax bills we're going to have to put the yield, and we're going to have to work on that on Monday, aren't we? Well, that's, that was part of why I wanted to go yeah. through this. Yeah, all right. Sure we'll need Mark to give us the yield and see if we can just draft that the tax bills will be laid out separately, side by side. We need to give them something. Well, let me, let me run through this. This is an insult. I like it. Um, 
because I have the yields from Mark. So, okay. um, but what I'm hearing is that the personal exemption and the standard deduction are going to stay the same. Yeah. Um, I talked to you a little bit the other day about how the house version stays with the, uh, the, the inflationary index that we've been using all along. Mm -hmm. um, so I, basically, number one is going to stay the same. Mm -hmm. Number two, uh, section two deals with the uh, rates in the brackets. We're not the, you're not going to do the, the collapsing. The two top but, uh, uh, rates here will be 8.85 mm -hmm. and 8.7. Mm -hmm. And then the other three brackets are going to come down 0 0.2. 0 0.2. The charitable in section three is going to change in that there will, no be, there will no longer be a $10,000 right. limit. We'll go back to the governor's original proposal of a 5% credit unchecked. The yeah. e, uh, ITC will stay the same. Yeah. The Social Security is staying the same. Yeah. And it's all as it happens. As it happens. Yes, same as the house. Yes. Right. Fully it's bought. 9 -11. Fully bought in. Fully bought in. Yes. Yeah. For what is the total down figure? Yes. Yeah. So yes. Eight point eight five. No, the full no, thing. The full thing. Eight point eight five. Yes. Yes. Correct. You're not getting any traction. No. What well, we we would keep saying we're worried about people at the bottom end who seventy percent they live on social security. But you and then we have a, You can't charge them less than zero. We're not taxing yeah, them. There's no, they don't, already, they don't pay taxes the, right now. Yeah, well, if that. you can't charge them less than zero, why are you going farther up? I don't know. Because they're not living very high in the hog either. Okay. Okay. Send me some money. So they're good. Me too. Okay. Yes. Annual linkage to the line. I'm going to have a small tweak to that. Yeah. Um, but then this was what I wanted to also draw attention to. You had Mark in here the other day talk about the uh, 58 million and the yields and non-residential rate that would be necessary in his um, well, when outlook. Well, he called me out. But I didn't know, what I, what I didn't know is whether you wanted to fill in those blanks with those numbers. Whatever, the yield for the property tax, that's Mark, what we should put those in is I think we need to put them in for the full bill right now. That's right. So I asked good. Steve Klein if anyone had told him I was supposed to find $58 million, and he said no, and no one has told me that I have to find $58 million. So we may well end up having to find just $58 just putting it off a little million. longer. School taxpayer pick up the $58 million. Yes, That's I mean, I pay. am sure that before we get out of here, there will be some adjustments, and there will be a much larger property tax nexus on this. Yeah. but. So that outlook Today. that Mark gave you the other day does have yields and a non-residential rate that yes. make the 58 million work that yes. balance out the Ed Fund. And okay. so I wanted to make sure that that was what I was supposed yeah. to, to use for now. Uh, it balances out the Ed Fund just so I understand an area that I don't understand. It balances it out, right. but at this point it would likely increase property taxes above. That's right. Oh, that's okay. how it's balancing it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. okay. That, that's how the balancing is happening. Um, then um, there was a technical right. change. Right. Oh, uh, that Mark talked about the average to median piece in there as well. What I'm hearing from the chair is you'd like to see a piece on the tax bill side by side. Um, yeah, I wanted to. Uh, and yeah, I think, was that technical change 10 going on the tax bill too? Yes. No, that wasn't on the tax bill. That was just on how the commissioner's December 1st. Yes, letter. that's what I thought. That stays here. It's the other true up seven that linkage that I'm also going to put on 922 just because that has to go and I'm not sure what will end up being vetoed or not vetoed so I'm doing the bells and suspenders. I'm sorry, Mitch, would you repeat what you're putting on 922? The, I'm putting in both places. Got it. Yeah, uh, it's just the annual linkage to the federal <laughs> tax rates um, and I just want to make sure that given all the changes that were linked and were linked where we need to be and um, that and, that and, works. And right now, I'm going to have a small change to that. Right now is that the linkage just goes to taxable years 2017, and I think it makes more sense to say December 31st, 2017, but it's, okay. it shouldn't be a huge um, a deal. Okay. Um, okay, so those are the changes I have. Thank you. I think that's it. Okay. The only other like, question, Madam Chair, maybe I can ask you this afterwards, uh -oh. but uh, I know this room is fucked. We should have. We should have.